Another day, another 10th vlog. Coffee on a Tuesday and vlog 50. In vlog 48, I talked about reality, how growing up it seemed to me that much of our social arrangements are convention, less rules than communal guidelines, only as strong as the community makes them. And since the community is nothing but people, its rules, its reality is as malleable, as fluid as we are. In vlog 49, I, without saying so, challenge that premise somewhat by asking whether or not you should give money to panhandlers. Now, it would be silly to think that by asking such a question, I was trying to get at the incidental convention of my given community at my given time, even if that type of answer is the most forthcoming. I was trying to uncover a deeper rule, a rule applicable to all circumstances and all times. I was trying to suss out the older and wiser sister of convention, its partner in the social universe the moral rule. Today I'd like to complete this trilogy of videos and complete this line of thinking about morality as best I can. Morality is about ought. It's about what we ought to do. When formulating a moral rule, we're not saying what we should do in order for this or that to happen. We have to be confident that what we say is applicable to all people as a general rule. For example, let's say your friend tells you that they just got a new haircut. They love it, but they want to know what you think. Well, you may think it looks bad, but you say that it doesn't because you don't want to hurt their feelings. Now, the moral rule isn't don't tell Jerry his bowl cut looks like shit because he's got a thin skin. Clearly, that applies only to Jerry. The moral rule might be worded, don't make people feel sad if you can help it. Maybe you think it's right to tell Jerry that his haircut is unflattering. You value the truth even if it hurts. Another legitimate moral rule, always be honest. You can see that morality is about right with a capital R and wrong with a capital W. And of course, people can disagree on that, like Jerry's two types of friends. But that's a pretty innocuous example. Here's another from Jonathan Haidt's The Righteous Mind. Decide whether the people in this story have done something morally wrong. So a family has a dog named Spot that they love. They've lived with him for many years. One day, Spot is tragically killed by a car in front of the family's house. The family, having heard that dog meat is delicious, cut up Spot's body, cook it, and eat him for dinner. Nobody sees them do this. So, what do you think? As Haight explains, what you're probably feeling is disgust. You want to say that this family has done something wrong, but then you remember it's their dog. It was already dead, so they didn't hurt it, and nobody saw them, so nobody was offended. Maybe in the end you decide that what the family did was disgusting, something that you would never dream of doing, but Morally wrong? Well, you have to say no. If that's your answer, if that's the way you feel, you're most likely from the West, and you're most likely a liberal. Your morality boils down more or less to what the utilitarian genius John Stuart Mill wrote in his essay on liberty, what most Western governments are based on. The only purpose for which power can be rightly exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent harm to others. In other words, maybe they're not people you'd want to be friends with, but it's their dog, they're eating it, nobody was hurt, so leave them alone. Now, if on the other hand you hear this story and you still say, yes, this is morally wrong, then you are working off another axis of morality. And to understand it, we have to look closer at what Haight calls moral foundations theory, the six axes of morality mixed and matched in different peoples around the world. First, we have care harm, what we've essentially already covered and what makes up most of the Western liberal morality, making sure that nobody is hurt unless they're trying to hurt others and that everyone is properly cared. For. Second, you have fairness cheating, something that will also be familiar to us. We believe that people should reap a proportional share of what they sow, and we despise those who try to get more for less work. Third, loyalty betrayal. What makes us feel pride for our groups, whether they be sports teams or political parties or nations, and what makes us feel rage against those who are traitorous to them. Fourth, authority subversion, which highlights the feeling that we need leaders and that we fall into some man-made or natural hierarchies like a family or a corporation. Navigating this moral terrain means respecting your superiors while gaining the respect from those below you so that you can move up and down the social ladder without triggering number five liberty oppression. 
we have a sense of when vulnerable groups are being exploited or when our liberties are being infringed upon, say, by a tyrant. This can be interpreted differently based on what your political leaning is. And finally, number six, sanctity degradation. What may cause us to feel that, yes, eating your own dog is morally wrong. There are higher and lower ways of life this foundation holds, like a spectrum stretching from lowly degenerates to pure souls. The Western liberal morality, as I said, leans heavily on the Care Harm Foundation, with a little bit of fairness cheating and liberty oppression thrown in. Liberals don't care so much about the other three. In fact, they may rail against them as immoral. But ours is not the only morality in the world. Many cultures, in fact, most cultures, in fact, some in our own country put a lot of their stock in sanctity degradation, for example, especially religious cultures. The Bible and other sacred texts are filled with rules on how you're supposed to act to align yourself with God. For what reason should the Bible teach abstinence or the Torah forbid pork if not that chastity is considered godly and pork is considered unclean and impure? These are just a couple of the modern manifestations of sanctity degradation. And like authority subversion and loyalty betrayal, they are felt more strongly in cultures where the community is the central unit, not the individual. This is why patriarchal societies exist in which there are roles for women that would make feminists gasp, but in which those women don't speak out because they see the family as more important than themselves. All of these are real moralities, and each foundation is the product of millions of years of evolution. They were naturally selected to overcome certain adaptive challenges like caring for one's children, or forming cohesive coalitions, or avoiding contaminants. Of course, the modern triggers for these foundations can be very different from the original ones. 100,000 years ago, staying pure meant staying clean to avoid infection, passing on animal meat that was rotten or poisonous. Today, it finds expression in virtue and vice, as they say, cleanliness is next to godliness. The essential point is that morality, a product of evolution, functions on more axes than simply the golden rule. That's a descriptive fact about humans, and understanding all six foundations will help you not to immediately brush off as stupid or evil those who think differently than you. It's not to say, to be clear, that all moralities and all moral foundations are equally good, but deciding what combination is best for society is the work of another field called normative ethics. It's work, I'm afraid, that I ought to leave up to you. Hey everybody, thank you so much for sticking with me for 50 vlogs. I, I can't believe we've done that many. Um, I think the nerd writer has transformed a lot uh, since the beginning. You know, th this is not a vlog about factoids or le just learning stuff. It's a vlog about building worldview. That's what the experiment of the nerd writer is. And I don't mean for you to take my worldview, and that's what these videos are. It's to see how you can build one for yourself. If you want to watch parts one and two of the Morality Trilogy, you can find them here. Also, don't forget to follow me on Tumblr and Twitter, links in the description. I hope you stay with me for another 50 vlogs. Um, I'm excited to talk about more interesting, more complex, more subtle stuff. Thanks.